Hello and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And in this episode of Word Magazine, I'm going to be going back and playing a clip from an interview that was done with Dr. Peter Gurry from Phoenix Seminary and Pastor Elijah Hickson of the Fireside Fellowship Church in Kingston, Tennessee. They were guests on the podcast of Dwayne Green, and he did a series of interviews with them that he posted on YouTube on his channel back in December. The first one was on December the 20th of 2021. And the topic was initially responding to so-called TR advocacy. So responding to people like me. Now, I guess we should be glad that he didn't say responding to TR onlyism, but more adequate would have been, you know, res re responding to those who support the traditional text or responding to confessional bibliology. But the way Dwayne worded it was the problems, ca all capital letters, by the way, in the title, the problems with TR advocacy. And again, he did, I think, three parts of this. And I was thinking maybe I would respond to uh, not all of the, the, the audio, but just a few points that came up in the discussion that I sort of took exception to. So I wanted to begin today with this first one. And the issue that came up in this, this first uh, podcast interview was Dwayne Green started asking them about the, the charge of those who are in confessional bibliology that the goal of textual criticism has changed. Whereas in the 19th and the 20th century, scholars would talk about trying to reconstruct the original autograph, modern and postmodern scholars no longer see that as the goal. First of all, they see it as impossible given the evidence. It's impossible to reconstruct the original. In many cases, they don't think that there is an original. Uh, and aside from that, it, 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 they see it as impossible. They talk about simply trying to reconstruct what they call the initial text. And uh, they suggest that all the variants are of equal authority and they represent the views of different uh, strands of Christianity. And so rather than taking the evidence and trying to reconstruct the original autograph, what scholars ought to do is look at the variants in order to uh, see uh, through windows into early Christianity. And this language of seeing the text as a window into early Christianity, I think was first coined by Bart Ehrman. So uh, Dwayne Green is gonna ask Gurry and uh, Pastor Hickson, whether or not uh, this charge is, um, is a fair one, is a reliable charge that the goal of textual criticism has changed. And their response is going to be, although, uh, yes, it's true of the academy, there are still evangelicals like them who are trying to find the original text. And so uh, I just want to test what they said on the podcast with what they have uh, written in some of their um, books and written material. So let's listen first to a clip from the interview. And then after that, I'm, I just got a stack of books here in front of me. I really don't have a script for this episode. I'm just gonna take some of their writings and, and, and uh, read them. And we can test whether or not uh, we, we think that, that what they say here is accurate and reliable as to whether or not there are, uh, there's a cadre of evangelical um, academic text critics who, going against the grain of the trends of modern textual criticism, are still trying to reconstruct the original autograph. So uh, let's begin listening to the clip. We're just going to listen to a minute or two of it. And uh, again, this was posted on YouTube on December the 20th of 2021 on Dwayne Green's YouTube channel. Dwayne is a Pentecostal pastor in Canada, and of late he's been doing a series uh, of, of podcast interviews related to the TR. I was a guest uh, on his podcast, and actually he recently asked me to return, and, and if we can work it out time-wise, I may come back and talk about some other things with him on his program. But uh, at any rate, uh, at my uh, um, blog at jeffriddle.net, I'll put a link 
uh, to uh, this podcast episode with Dwayne Green if you want to listen to the entire thing if you've not already heard it. So I'm going to start here at about, I think it's about the 7 minute 40 second mark. And again, we're just going to play a little bit of it uh, to get a flavor. So listen for what Gurry and Hickson say about the goal of New Testament textual criticism. They concede that it's shifted in mainstream academic textual criticism, but their point is that they, uh, uh, among others, uh, are still holding to basically the old goal of trying to reconstruct the original. So here is the podcast. You know, my church who use the NLT, they love the Lord. They love his word. So it becomes difficult to say, well, you don't have the word of God. I, I can totally, totally relate to that. On the other hand, uh, we talk about like the autograph or, or the originals. I know things have changed in the text critical uh, community as, as far as the autograph and some stuff that kind of comes out, especially from TR advocates, is that we're no longer searching for the autographs. Is, is that true? Who's the we? is the main thing to ask about that question, right? So, <clears throat> you know, somebody like Jeff Riddle, I've gone back and forth with him on this, because are there, are there people in, in, in the academy who do not think the original text is a viable goal or even a good goal to, to aim for? Absolutely. Do they represent the entire academic guild of text criticism? No, they don't. Some of them are prominent. Some of them are very good scholars and very important, you know, like David Parker for sure. But with due respect to David Parker, he doesn't represent the entire field. So, yeah, if you've been following my podcast, you know about this ongoing interaction that I've had with Gurry since uh, we did a, a joint appearance uh, now two years ago uh, on another podcast. And I had noted the, the shift in the goal of textual criticism. And he famously said to me, oh, that, it's not a major shift at all. It's just a minor shift. And I said, I read to him, you know, some of the things that David C. Parker has, has said about the changing goal of New Testament textual criticism. Oh, Parker's not that important. He's not that significant. And in one of my follow-up uh, podcasts, I noted the fact that um, uh, Tommy Wasserman, who co-authored a book with Peter Gurry, dedicated... Uh, the book that he co-wrote with Jennifer Canoost on the woman taking adultery passage to David C. Parker. And I pointed out that David C. Parker is the editor of the, the, the ECM edition of the Gospel of John, which will appear in future editions of the Nessel Aland uh, Novum Testamentum Graeke. And to say that he's insignificant or that the views that he has on the goal of textual criticism are insignificant is simply to ignore reality. But but Gurry at least is now conceding, yes, that the shift has taken place. There is a huge shift that's taken place. But he's still wanting to downplay it. And he's also wanting to say, well, that's happening, but you know, I uh, and, and others are still trying to, uh, who are evangelicals, we're still trying for the old goal of uh, reconstructing the original. Let's listen to a little bit more. To the degree that there are a whole bunch of us still in the field working on text criticism who still think the original text is a viable goal, the answer is no. So it's yes and no. Depends who you... Right, right. For the past three years, okay. I've, I've worked full time for two and then part time in the past, the, the past year. I've worked with Dirk Yonkend on forthcoming textual commentary for the Tyndale House Greek New Testament. And early on, we had this discussion of like, how are we phrasing it. I have a terrible memory for stuff like this, but I think it was Dirk who said, let's just use the phrase original text because that's what we mean. Right. <laughs> okay. So uh, Pastor Elijah Hickson chimes in and he says, we're, work we're working on the Tyndale House Greek New Testament textual commentary. When I talked with Dirk Youngkin, we're going to use the term original text. It'll be interesting to see that textual commentary when it comes out. But in just a few moments, we'll look at what it actually says in the Tyndale House Greek New Testament in the introduction about what they were attempting to do with this edition. And I think you'll find that it's actually a little bit different than the way uh, Pastor Hickson presents it. Let's listen just, just a little bit more. <laughs> Throughout the textual commentary, that's the language that we've used, at least in, the, in all of the... And they're just, you know, being chummy, laughing it up. How silly to think that we're not seeking the original. It's right there. Yes, we're, we're seeking the original text. Well, we'll see. Drafts that we've done for the past three years, uh, we're identifying the original text, and that's the that's the that's really the purpose of it. So would you guys uh, go on record 
go on record and, and say that you are concerned with finding the original text? Yes. They both shake their head and they say, yes. Will you go on record saying that you are interested in finding the original text? Um, and they both say, yes. What I think Dwayne Green doesn't realize, and perhaps other people listening, is they may say yes to that, but if you were to if you were to push them a little bit more, they're going to have to have a very nuanced answer to that. They're not attempting to reconstruct the original in any sense that someone might understand it in a plain sense manner. They're not going to come away from their study of the extant manuscript evidence and virginal evidence saying that they have the original. They're gonna have a much more nuanced answer uh, to that question. But at this point, he has them, quote, go on the record, end quote, as saying, no, they're, they wanna search for the original. Again, let's, we'll look at their writings in a minute and see if you think that, that what they have written is consistent with this so-called pledge or, or saying this on the record. Awesome. Awesome. If we want to nitpick at the words, I think identify the original text might be because if you find something that's lost, right, you identify something that's that's there. And I think that it gives a slightly more accurate nuance to what we So Elijah's already coming in wanting to wanting to refine it a little bit. Well, it's not really we're going to reconstruct the original. We're going to we're going to identify uh, what the original is. And actually, I sort of agree with him on that that it, it's, not, it's not the task of Christians from a Christian perspective to reconstruct the, the text. What the Christians do is recognize the self-authenticating power of the New Testament te text, uh, the authentic New Testament text, although I don't think uh, that, that Pastor Hickson would say it quite that way. But um, he's got to have a more nuanced answer. And so he's, he's, he's gone on record, made the pledge, but now he's trying to walk it back a little bit with uh, giving it some nuance. We do. So let's let's kind of turn gears here. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. I think they go on and talk about the coherence-based genealogical method. And for our purposes, I just wanna hone in on this question of, are, is, the, are there, uh, uh, is, is there a group of evangelical academic textual critics like Gurry and Hickson who are going against the mainstream trends of academic scholarship and they're bucking the trends and they're fighting for reconstructing the original over against modern textual criticism, which no longer sees that as a viable or worthwhile goal. And so um, I, I, let me just begin by reading a couple of things. And I'm gonna start off with DC Parker. And uh, I want to read a little bit from his book, Textual Scholarship on the Making of the New Testament. This came from the Lyle Lectures that he gave at Oxford University, and this was published by Oxford University Press. And in the opening to this, this book, in one of his opening lectures, he talks about the modern critical text and the shift that has taken place. Uh, so he says on page 26, but there still remains a gap between the form of text from which we conclude by critical examination that the extant witnesses must be descended and the yet older form or forms from which that oldest recoverable text must be descended. Later, he says, the immediate concern of textual bibliography is, is only to recover as exactly as may be the oldest recoverable forms of the text beneath the manuscript copies. That's a quotation from um, someone named uh, Bowers or a rephrasing of someone named Bowers. So we're not attempting to recover exactly uh, the original. We're trying to find the oldest recoverable forms. Um, he continues, this is also on page 26. He says, we can underline emphatically that the authorial fallacy is a fallacy. The New Testament philologist task is not, and he puts it in italic, to recover an original authorial text. Not only because we cannot at present know on philological grounds what that original might have been, nor even because there may have been several forms to the tradition, but because philology is not able to make a pronouncement as to whether or not there was such an authorial text. 
The best it can do with regard to the New Testament is to use evidence derived from our study of the extant tradition to present a model of the problems with the concept of the author. And so clearly, D.C. Parker uh, is, is in these lectures in 2012 is presenting this shift that's taken place. Later on, he says, this is on pages 28 and 29 now of his book, uh, New, uh, Textual Scholarship and the Making of the New Testament. He says, as the person who came up with a theory of the living text of the Gospels, and as one of the tiny number of people employed in making a critical edition of the New Testament, I am probably uniquely qualified to appreciate the niceties of the situation. I have had to ask myself whether I am trying to maintain a tension between two irreconcilable opinions, and my answer is that I do believe that it is possible to reconstruct an initial text and to hold my view of the text's earlier history. We can use philology to reconstruct an initial text, but we need not then believe that the initial text is an authorial text or a definitive text or the only form in which the work works once circulated. It is also possible that we may reach the conclusion that our extant manuscripts are descended not from one single initial text, but from several. So what he's saying here is, he, first of all, he's letting you know, listen, there aren't very many people involved in creating, reconstructing the, the, the modern critical text. Um, he's one of very few people. Peter Gurry and Pastor Hickson are not uh, working on the ECM. Um, they write about it, but they're not working on it. Um, now, D.C. Parker is a real gatekeeper for the modern academic scholarly text of the Bible. And he said, I'm one of very few people, and I can tell you, we're not trying to find the original text. We're, we're trying to reconstruct what he calls the initial text. Uh, sometimes they use the German word, the Ausgangs text. And he says, let me tell you, this initial text that we're attempting to reconstruct, which is the oldest recoverable form of the text, is not the authorial text. In fact, he doesn't believe there's a definitive text. Um, and he talks about the living text of the Bible. So here's someone who's a, who's a bona fide gatekeeper in modern academia, and he's saying, we're not looking for the original text. That's an improper goal of textual criticism. Now, now, Peter Gray said, well, there are some people like David C. Parker, but those of us who are evangelicals, there, there's a cadre of us uh, who are, are bucking that trend. Well, again, we're going to see in just a couple of minutes uh, whether that's, that's adequate. Let me just do one more thing. Let me, let me uh, pick up Abidon Paul Shaw's book, Changing the Goalposts of New Testament Textual Criticism. Again, it's, it's another interesting thing. Peter Gurry told me there hasn't been a major shift uh, it's just been a minor shift. Um, but Paul Abidon Shah wrote a PhD dis dissertation at Southeastern Seminary uh, under the direction of Maurice Robinson. And the whole uh, thesis of his dissertation was, indeed, that there's been a shift in the goal of New Testament textual criticism. And he sees it as highly problematic for evangelicals, for evangelical theology. And oddly enough, although Peter Gurry uh, attempted to refute uh, my contention that this shift had taken place. Uh, he warmly embraced Paul Abaddon Shah and had a, has a guest uh, in his um, classroom uh, teaching uh, online. But let me just read the opening line or two from Shah's dissertation. He says, before the 1960s, this is page one of his, of his book, Changing the Goalposts of New Testament Textual Criticism. Before the 1960s, the goal of New Testament Textual Criticism was singular to retrieve the original text of the New Testament. Since then, the goalpost has incrementally shifted away from the original text to retrieve any text or many texts of the New Testament. Under this new approach to the text, all variants are considered to be equally valuable, regardless of their external evidence in the history of transmission. Previously, variants were looked upon as a means to recover the original text, but now they are increasingly treated as windows into the various early Christian communities and their struggles with doctrines. Now it is considered far more profitable to gain insight into the various Christianities, plural, 
or trajectories of faith in the early church than to seek after an elusive and elusive original text. And I'll end the quotation there. So this is something that Paul Abidan Shah has noticed. But again, we've still got Gurry saying, yeah, that's true, that's true. Shah's thesis is true, but that's not what some of us in the field are doing. We have not succumbed uh, to this trend, and we are still pursuing the old goal of reconstructing the original. Well, let's just test and see if that's true. If that's true, let's let's pick up uh, Gurry's book that he co-wrote with Tommy Wasserman. And this book uh, is a sort of a simplified version of uh, Gurry's a PhD dissertation, which was on the coherence-based genealogical method, the CBGM method, the new method that's being applied to the critical uh, uh, texts of the New Testament. And um, so the book is A New Approach to Textual Criticism, subtitled An Introduction to the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. Uh, this was published uh, by SBL Press, uh, and it came out in 2017. And here is the opening page. This is page one, the introduction. Uh, it begins, textual criticism is a discipline that tries to restore texts. The need for this arises whenever the original document of a written work has been lost and the existing copies no longer agree with each other. Textual criticism is needed for all 27 books in the New Testament because so far as we know, None of the autographs still exists. Again, I want you to notice the tentative language here. So far as we know, none of the autographs still exists. All were lost to the ravages of time and use. The trove of manuscripts, versions, and citations of the New Testament that we do have agree significantly overall, yet the sheer number of times the New Testament was copied explain why there are so many differences between them. Textual variation leaves the modern and ancient reader in a fix. Which text should we read? Which should be applied? Which should be preached? This is one of the questions that textual criticism tries to answer. For the New Testament, this means trying to determine at each place where our copies disagree and where the author and dis disagree what the author most likely wrote or failing this at least what the earliest text might have been. So are you seeing already the influence of this shift in method? He says, what we're trying to find out is what the author likely wrote, tentative, what he perhaps wrote. We don't have the autographs to check, and we don't know what the autographs were because we don't have any uh, way of verifying the accuracy of any copies. And if we can't determine what the author not what he wrote, but what he likely wrote, then we want to determine at least what the earliest text might have been. So that's initial text. That's Ausgang's text language. He continues, In this way, the work of textual criticism is fundamental to interpretation, since you cannot read a text you do not have. Because the interest of most readers of the New Testament is in what the authors wrote, this is what New Testament textual criticism has traditionally aimed to determine as much as possible. It's, it's what it's, it's, he's talking about traditional method. Yes, was trying to reconstruct the original as much as possible, he says. And then he says this, this is now on page two, where that is not possible, it aims to reach back as closely to the initial text as it can. So on the very first page, this book co-written by Gurry, he's saying, my goal in textual criticism is, is, to, is to try to tell you what it's likely that perhaps the, author, the original author wrote, but barring that, my goal is to give you the initial text. Well, isn't that a, pretty much what D.C. Parker is saying? That we can't find out with any certainty what the original was. And so the best that we can do is give you the oldest recoverable text. And isn't Gurry saying basically the same thing? Um, let's, let's look at the Myth and Mistakes book that uh, Gurry and Pastor Hickson uh, co-edited. Uh, Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism. 
And this came out, uh, let's see here, from InterVarsity Press in 2019. I have written a review of this book. I didn't write a review of it for a long time. I did write one, and it's it's uh, supposed to come out in Puritan Reform Journal. Um, the it, it was supposed to come out in the first issue of that from 2022, the January 2022, and they told me that they had a problem with a shortage of paper, and so they weren't able actually to print uh, the physical copy of the Puritan Reform Journal. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're hoping to get printed soon. Uh, once it gets in print, I'll probably do just a reading of my review of the Myths and Mistakes book. But if you look at the Myths and Mistakes book, uh, there's a foreword that's written by Daniel B. Wallace, uh, who is, is well known among evangelical scholars. But he's another person like Gurry and Hickson, we could say who does a lot of writing about New Testament textual criticism, but he's not really in the vanguard. He's not really a gatekeeper. He's not editing the uh, text, the ECM text that's going to be printed uh, by the, the um, German Bible Society, but he writes a lot about it. And so uh, Gurry and Hickson ask Daniel Wallace to give a forward to the book. And uh, in the forward to the book, um, Wallace makes a, a very peculiar statement that has been picked up on a lot since 2019 by those who are in the confessional bibliology movement. And it's a statement that we sort of see as problematic for the whole enterprise of evangelicals attempting to use um, the modern uh, text critical method and how the goals of modern textual criticism have basically influenced evangelicals. Evangelicals have not influenced the academy um, they've not influenced uh, the academy to try to uh, uh, find the original, reconstruct the original, but instead the academy has influenced evangelicals who are now using the same nomenclature um, as uh, the academy. So um, this is on, let's see, pages Roman numeral uh, 11 and 12. And I'm, actually, I'll just pick it up on uh, Roman numeral uh, 12. Uh, these two attitudes, this is Daniel B. Wallace writing the, the foreword to uh, Gary and Hickson's edited work, Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism. These two attitudes, radical skepticism and absolute certainty, must be avoided when we examine the New Testament text. Here's the famous statement. We do not have now in our critical Greek texts or any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain, but we also do not need to be overly skeptical. Where we should land between these two extremes is what this book addresses. And the astounding statement he makes here is that when we pick up the modern critical text of the Greek New Testament, we really don't know, have any clue as to whether or not this is actually the autograph or the original. And, and even if it was the original, we would have no uh, external means of testing, or proving, or validating that it is, in fact, the original text. And then this is what he says in the next paragraph. Now he's talking about Hickson and Gurry and the other younger relatively younger academic scholars who contributed the chapters to this book. He says, the new generation of evangelical scholars is far more comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty than previous generations. They know the difference between core beliefs and those that are more peripheral. They recognize that even if we embrace the concept of absolute truth, Absolute certainty about it is a different matter. End of the quotation. So if Gurry and Hickson are really swimming against the stream of modern academic textual criticism, and they are trying to reconstruct the original, and they're, 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 they're rejecting uh, the, the, the relativism of Parker's approach and the, the approach of others, why then do they have... Hmm. Daniel Wallace essentially say in the foreword to this book that they're part of a new generation of evangelical scholars uh, who are 
who are comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. And what's the uncertainty about? Uncertainty about the text. And again, it's, it's, it's amazing that Wallace, an evangelical, is basically putting forward an idea that's recycled from Protestant liberalism. When there was the battle for the Bible in the early 20th century and, there, and the so-called fundamentalists or conservatives were saying, we believe in the infallibility of Scripture, it was the Protestant liberals who said, well, you know, we, we can't be sure about, you know, the truth of all the things that the Bible affirms with respect to history and, and language and such, but we can be sure that there's good doctrine in there. That, that, that it basically has some of the right ideas if it's not the right words, if it's not the right text, if it's not the right historical affirmations. And this is simply a recycling of Protestant liberalism where it's saying we can have absolute certainty about the basic message of the New Testament, though we can't have any absolute certainty about what the text of it actually is. And so um, this is, you know, again, it's just succumbing to... Um, you know, Protestant liberalism, mainline Protestant liberalism, which is secular liberalism for that matter. So let's go on and now let's look on uh, at, at the introduction that Gurry and Hickson give to the book. And on pages 20 and 21, they talk about uh, the uh, reliability of the New Testament text. And this is what they write, again, starting on page 20. If defending the Bible's textual integrity is a noble cause, it remains to offer a working definition of what we mean when we say it is reliable. Simply put, we believe the textual evidence we have is sufficient to reconstruct, in most cases, what the authors of the New Testament wrote. And again, this may, you may say this is a statement that is affirming what was said in this podcast. They believe that the textual evidence, the extant textual evidence, is sufficient to reconstruct what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Um, again, I think that claim can be challenged. That would be another discussion, that there is adequate extant evidence. But what's important here is the disclaimer in this state, in this sentence, in most cases. Simply put, we believe the textual evidence we have is sufficient to reconstruct in most cases what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Well, what does that mean? That means there are cases where it's impossible to reconstruct what the authors of the New Testament wrote so that the original text of the New Testament cannot actually be reconstructed. And this is what Gurry and Hickson are really conceding at the beginning of this work. It's impossible to reconstruct, in all cases, the original text of the New Testament. So uh, here we go, this, continuing from uh, after that sentence. We cannot do this with equal certainty, that is, reconstruct the, what the original authors wrote, in every case, of course. And the following chapters will discuss places where doubt remains significant. Nor do we think that God has preserved the original text of the New Testament equally well at every point in history or at every place in the world. Well, of course, this is a, this is a direct um, denunciation of what's said in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1 and paragraph 8, that, that God has kept the word pure in all ages. And so, you know, again, I don't think either one of these men claim to be confessionally reformed. They're broad, mainstream evangelicals. So perhaps it's not surprising. What I would ask, if you're out there listening to this, however, and you are confessionally reformed, I want you to understand that this statement is diametrically opposite of what Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1 and paragraph 8 says. And so, you know, do you really believe uh, in the confession? Do you really strictly subscribe to the confession of faith? If so, you'll recognize in that statement something that is the opposite of what the confession affirms. Uh, they continue, sometimes in places have had better manuscripts, editions, or translations at their disposal than others. This is true today, and it was true in the past. Nevertheless, 
We do think that even the most textually corrupted of our manuscripts and editions still convey the central truths of the Christian faith with clarity and power. So get what they're saying here. Again, this is back to our whole discussion about, about the errors of, in the 20th century of Protestant liberalism. They're saying even though our manuscripts are a mess and they're corrupted, we believe that they still, ha ha even though they're, they're textually corrupted, they still have the possibility to convey what they call the central truths of the Christian faith with clarity and power. They continue, in every age, God has given his people a text that is more than reliable enough to know the saving work he has accomplished through Jesus Christ. So what they're saying is, as long as you can read the New Testament in whatever form it is, and you read something about Jesus, then that's adequate, even if we don't really know what the original was. Does this sound like people who are saying with confidence, we believe we can, struct, we can reconstruct the original text of Scripture? Uh, or does this sound like people who are trying to say, you know, admit defeat from the beginning, we can't reconstruct it, but we think there's, a, there's enough things you can learn about Jesus in there that, um, that it's not a hopeless case. Um, they continue, this is page 21, to be sure the incredible discoveries of the last several hundred years and the enormous labors of textual critics from past eras have done much to identify God's inspired word and to increase our confidence in their recovery. In textual criticism, as in so much else, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Perhaps it would be best then to let one of those giants clarify what we mean when we say the text of the New Testament is reliable. Johann Albrecht Bingel, who lived from 1687 to 1752, was a student in Germany who became troubled by the variants he encountered in the New Testament. After a lifetime of study and the production of his own important edition of the Greek New Testament, he concluded that these variants shake no pillar of the Christian faith. He writes, quote, God's testimony concerning his son, Jesus Christ, is truly abundant and worthy of our respect. The main thrust of what God wants us to learn never hangs on one single particle or word. The faith of the saints accordingly rests on sure and true foundations. But in the same way that a grain of gold, no matter how small, is nonetheless gold, so the smallest portion of the word which comes from the mouth of God is divine. For this reason, whoever holds in reverence whatever comes from the mouth of God will be bound. In consequence, to seek out the most accurate reading of the New Testament scriptures as well. That's the end of the quotation. And this is the last, uh, let's see, couple sentences here to end this, this section on page 21 after that quotation from Bingle. We agree with Bingle both in his confidence in the text's ability to support our faith and in the need to continue studying that text to ferret out every grain of gold where doubts remain. Our text is more than adequate for what we need, yet the nature of God's word requires us to seek out its original form to the full extent of our God-given abilities. And so you might say, well, that, it, maybe that, that's supporting what they're saying. They want to seek out the original form of the text. But notice the concessions. We can only do this to the full extent of our God-given abilities. I mean, it's sort of interesting because it's so human-centered. Uh, we can do it as long as we're really smart and we can really do this. And it doesn't, you know, there, there's no stress here on God preserving his word. Um, but anyways... Again, the thing that's even more troubling, though, is this: there really isn't much confidence in reconstructing the original here. What what the confidence in is that even though the Bible is corrupted, it, it supposedly hasn't corrupted the doctrine. And this is one of the oldest arguments of evangelicals who, who um, to buttress, to, um, to support their embracing of the modern critical text. They say, well, at least no cardinal doctrines are affected. But of course, cardinal doctrines are affected by modern textual criticism. Uh, clearly, things like the integrity of Scripture, things like the, the, the canon of Scripture, the canonical text of Scripture, and then beyond that, of course, things uh, uh, like, um, you know, what does the Bible actually say in John 1.18? Does it describe the Lord Jesus as the only begotten Son, or is he the one and only God, as it says in modern translations? Or is Christ affirmed uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 to be God manifest in the flesh? Um, 
So we could go on and on. Of course, there are fundamental doctrines that are involved in the text of Scripture. And uh, Bingle's quote notwithstanding, um, it, it, there are problems with a text that, um, that, that alters fundamental Christian beliefs, like John 1.18, I already listed it as an example. So at any rate, I think you can see that this pledge that was taken uh, in uh, Dwayne Green's um, podcast is more than a little dubious. Um, I, let me, let me uh, add, just add one more thing. Uh, Pastor Hickson talked about his work on the forthcoming textual commentary of the Tendo House Greek New Testament. And he's assured us that, you know, uh, they're going to use the word original text. Well, it'll be interesting to see if they do that. But if we take the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which came out in 2017, and we look at the introduction, which interestingly enough is at the end of, of the book on page 505, here's the first sentence within it. This edition aims to present in an easily readable format the best approximation to the words written by the New Testament authors within the constraints of the documentary evidence that survives. Now, that statement is extremely nuanced. It doesn't begin, this edition aims to present the original, the autograph. This edition aims to present what the apostles wrote and what the early Christians received as the inspired word of God. No, it doesn't say that. What it says is, this edition aims to present in, in an easily readable format the best approximation of the words written by the New Testament. How do we know if they got it right? Um, uh, her, Gary and Hickson have told us that in most cases they can do it, but, but that, that means they can't do it in every case. And how do we evaluate whether or not they got it right? Um, so again, this is not the perspective. And you, we can see here the influence of modern textual criticism and the shifting goals. Another evidence of this is the fact that in the Tyndale House Greek New Testament in the apparatus, there are various places where they put a diamond. And that's, that's what we see now in the newest uh, editions of the Nestle Lalan Greek New Testament. Places where uh, the editors say, we're not sure what the reading should be at this point. On page 515 of the introduction to the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, under uh, the heading, the apparatus, it says, a selection of variants is found at the bottom of most printed pages. The choice of variants is deliberately diverse and consists of three main categories which may overlap. And here's the first category. Variants that were in the eyes of the editor extremely close contenders for consideration for the main text. In some cases, the editors were in doubt as to the correct decision. These are marked by a diamond. Notice he doesn't say in some cases the editors were um, in doubt as to what the original autograph was. And I think probably they would say that, that they were not uh, uh, thinking that they were giving you the definitive original, but they were giving the, you the initial text. And even in some cases, they had doubts as to whether a reading should be reading A or reading B or reading C and so forth. So again, um, I'm, I'm skeptical about the claim that there are evangelicals who are really uh, trying to pursue the old goal of reconstructing the autograph. Again, it seems to me from what I've read, what I've seen, what I've heard, is that many evangelicals who are in the academy are simply being influenced by the changes that have taken place in mainstream academic New Testament textual criticism. And it doesn't seem to me as though they're having much impact on the people who really are the gatekeepers for this discipline. Well, this is going to bring this episode of Word Magazine to a conclusion. I know in some recent Word Magazine episodes, I've been interviewing different people and we've been talking about more uh, churchly issues. And so it's kind of nice to get back to talking about issues related to textual criticism of the Bible. Anyways, I hope that this episode has been helpful, useful, edifying for those who are listening. And I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next Word Magazine Till then, take care and God bless.